First things first, let's get a taste of business intelligence. Of course, we've all seen Netflix. The nice feature about Netflix is that it provides personalized things. By that, what we mean is that it can take a movie and tell us what it thinks our rating for the movie will be. It's personalized in the sense it's not just the average of all the ratings of all the people who have rated the movie. No, it is what it predicts specifically for the user. For example, if I visit Netflix, it might tell me that my rating for the movie I Am Sam is 4.3. If you went and looked at your rating for the movie, predicted rating for the movie, assuming you've not yet rated it, it might give you some other number completely. So the question is, how does Netflix manage to do this? This recommendation system is actually very important for Netflix. Consider the fact that Netflix actually conducted a competition to find or to build this recommendation system and the winning team won a million dollars as you can see on this web page. So clearly this is something that is mission critical for Netflix and all they were asking for was a 10% improvement over their current recommendation system. A 10% improvement in accuracy is all that Netflix was asking for. And that was what the winning application achieved. And what they got was a million dollars as a price. Not bad for a few nerds tapping away at their keyboards. So let's make things a little bit concrete. Let's consider 11 songs, which I've named like Tears in Heaven, La Bamba, Mrs. Robinson, etc., etc. And let's take the ratings given to these songs by a bunch of people. For example, Strauser, La Ladik, Rosenthal, Boroff, McRae, Mest, Wand, and so on. Okay, so each person has rated each of these songs on a five point scale, one, two, three, four, five. And of course, you can see that every person has not rated every song. For example, Strauser has not rated Yesterday, Wizard of Oz, Fiddler on the Roof, and uh, Sunday, Bloody Sunday. I don't know what that song is. And uh, for example, Boroff has not rated Mrs. Robinson, Wizard of Oz, What a Wonderful Land, Let It Be, and so on and so forth. So you can see what this table is really representing. Uh, and on the last column, I've got your ratings, of course, uh, actual ratings, but just made up. Of course, this whole table is completely made up. So your rating for La Bamba is three. Your rating for Yesterday is two. Your rating for Wizard of Oz is four. Beethoven is two. And What a Wonderful World is five. Okay, so we've got your ratings. We've got a bunch of other people's ratings. Now notice that not everybody has rated every song. And let's take, for example, your ratings. You have not rated Fiddler on the Roof. Okay, now this could be a typical situation that Netflix could find itself in. That, you know, a bunch of ratings of people. Of course, not everybody has rated every song or every movie. So now it is faced with this task of predicting. So for example, suppose you visit the, the site and you want to find out what is your predicted rating for Fiddler on the Roof. Okay, so that's really what we want to predict. How might we go about this task? We'll not be looking at the actual algorithm that Netflix uses, but we look at something similar to get an idea of how these things are actually done. So let's make things concrete. Let's consider first a simple example as we build up to the final solution. Let's say there's a movie for which you want to find your predicted rating, and you've got two nice looking friends, Alice and Bob, who've both seen the movie and who have actually given rating to the movie. So for example, Alice considers the movie a three and a five, and Bob considers the movie a four and a five. Okay, so now what is your predicted rating for this movie? Now it depends really. You may say, well, my predicted rating would depend on who I'm more similar to, or you may say my predicted rating is just going to be the average of these two. So let's consider first that you give both opinions equal weight and therefore your prediction is going to be just the average of these two. And let's say your prediction therefore is calculated as a 3.5, the average of three and four. On the other hand, suppose you say, well, you know what, I'm a lot, my opinions are a lot closer to the opinions of Bob. And therefore 
I want to give Bob's rating twice the weight when I calculate my predicted weight. So I'm not completely overruling Alice, but I'm just going to weigh more heavily what Bob is rated. And therefore, my rating would tend to be closer to four than to three. Okay. So in that case, uh, your rating is going to be Bob's opinion being twice of Alice's opinion. And therefore, you're going to multiply Bob's weight by two, but Alice's weight just by one. So you will get a rating of 3.67, which is nothing but three, which is Alice's rating, plus two times Bob's rating, which is two times four, divided by the total of their two weights. The weight for Alice being one and the weight for Bob being two, total weight is three. And that is how you get the weighted average this time. Earlier, we just took the simple average, or you could think of it as both of them equally weighted, uh, which is one and one, and therefore the denominator is two. You could look at it that way. Or you could just say that's a simple average. And in this case, we have taken a weighted average with Bob getting a weight of two and Alice getting a weight of one. Of course, conversely, you might say my ratings are more close to Alice and though I'm going to weight her ratings by two, in which case you'll say it's two times Alice's rating, which is two times three plus one times Bob rating four divided by the total, which is three. And therefore you get a rating of 3.33, which is closer to Alice's rating. Okay, and of course, this, these are not the only values possible. There's really an infinite range of values possible. You could weight uh, Alice's rating as one, Bob's rating as zero, in which case you're completely disregarding Bob's opinion and therefore your rating is going to be three. On the other hand, you could completely disregard Alice's rating and regard only Bob's rating, in which case you'll get a four. And then of course, you could have all kinds of weightings in between. So really, you could have any rating between three and four depending upon what weights you give to their ratings. Okay, so that's the simple idea. So just to make sure we're on the same page, let's consider and extend this example to three people, you know, have three good looking friends, Alice, Bob and Gina, <coughs> and they have rated some particular movie uh, or a song or whatever it is. And the ratings are three, four and 3.5. And of course, you have determined based on some criteria the weights you would like to give to their ratings. So you want to weight Alice's rating by three, Bob's rating by two, and Gina's rating is five because you think your, your tastes are very, very similar to that of Gina's. And now you can calculate the weighted average once again as three times three, which is Alice's rating multiplied by the weight for Alice, plus Bob's rating multiplied by the weight for Bob, uh, plus uh, Gina's rating multiplied by the weight for Gina. So three times three, two times four, five times 3.5 divided by 10, which is the total of all the weights, five plus three plus two. Okay, so that turns out to be 3.45 because the total, the numerator is uh, 34.5. That's the numerator. So the total weight, the weighted average comes out to 3.45. Okay, this is nothing different from what we did on the last slide. It's just that we've extended it from two people to three people to make sure we understand the concept. Nothing complicated here. Of course, the million dollar question literally is how did we arrive at these weights three, two and five to be assigned to Alice, Bob and Gina? How did we get at those numbers? And imagine if you're doing this on a computer based algorithm, you need some objective way by which these weights can be calculated. In a manual example, of course, we could sit down and assign the weights and perform the calculations. But in a computer system, the weights have to be calculated somehow. And that's the million dollar question in this case. So let's see how that is done. So let's look at the main task. The main task is we've got a whole matrix of ratings given by various people to various songs. And we've got our ratings on the extreme right column. There are some songs that we've rated and some songs which we've not rated. And the job now, of course, is to predict what our rating for Fiddler on the Roof is going to be. Now, of course, in reality, you'll see that you won't have only so many ratings. Consider Netflix or iTunes. They are going to have ratings literally by tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people for several hundred or several thousand songs. And the job is going to be using all of those numbers, how to arrive at a prediction for a particular individual for a particular song or movie. So in this example, simple example, we are considering how are we going to calculate that my rating or your rating for Fiddler on the Roof based on all of these ratings that are in the system? 
So that's our that's our main problem. So in order to do that clearly, what we'll want to do is, let's take Fiddler on the roof here. We already know that Ladik has rated it as four, Rosenthal has rated it as a three, Borov has rated it as a four, McRae has rated it as a three, and Wand has rated it as a four. How can we combine all of these ratings and find a weighted rating for you? Okay, this is an extension. Earlier we had done a weighted rating for three people. All we are now saying is, we need to find a weighted rating for five people. But of course, the million dollar question is, what weights should we assign to these five people who have rated this particular song? Now, people who have not rated this song, like Mest and uh, uh, Henry and so on, we are not interested in them, at least for this particular example. Okay, so that's the point. So we are now going to try and find out what method could we possibly use to identify weights for these people. Once we have the weights, it's a simple matter to calculate the weighted average. Again, let's take a simple example. Let's say there are two songs and three people, A, B, and C, have rated these two songs. And for convenience, we have plotted the ratings on an XY plot. So for example, you see that A rated song one as a one and rated song two as a two, right? Which is why we've plotted A as one, two. B rated song one as a two and song two as a one. And C rated song one as a three and song two as a one. Now, simply because there are two songs, we are able to do this. The moment you have three songs, you can still plot it on a three-dimensional chart. It would look a little bit difficult to read. But once it goes beyond that, there's no way we can plot it on paper. But conceptually, it is possible to think of it as a point in hyperdimensional space, in n-dimensional space. So here, since there are two songs, we were able to plot each of these points as a point in two-dimensional space. Okay, now the point is, A's rating is 1, 2, B's rating is 2, 1, C's rating is 3, 1. So we want to find out among these three people, they've rated two songs whose ratings are closer to each other. Okay, now one way we could do that as a measure of similarity would be to calculate the distance between these points. After all, these are points in geometric Euclidean space. We can always calculate the distance and say if two points are far away, then the ratings are dissimilar. If two points are close together, then the ratings are similar. If two points are exactly in the same place, then the ratings are identical, right? So it's possible to use distance as a measure of similarity between two points. So in this case, of course, we know how to calculate the distance between two points in two dimensional space. We could use the Pythagorean theorem to do that. So if we do that, then we find the distance between A and B is 1.414. How is that? Well, you can construct this right angle triangle here. Okay, and this distance is one, this distance is one, and therefore this distance is going to be square root of one square plus one square, which is square root of two, and that is 1.414. Okay, so we are just using the Pythagorean theorem to calculate that. Construct a right angle triangle and then calculate the distance. Now it's easier to calculate the distance between B and C because it's not really a triangle, it's just a straight line. The, they are both at one on the y-axis, so it's only the x-axis, which is two in one case, three in the other case, so the distance is one. It's a lot simpler. And the distance between A and C is a little bit more complicated. It is, uh, you know, one and three, that is two square, four plus one, five, and it's square root of five, okay, which is 2.24. So that's how you calculate the distances. So clearly we can see that from the point of view of A, B is much closer than C is. From the point of view of B, C is much cl C is closer than that of A. And from the point of view of C, B is closer than A is. Right. So clearly, if you look at B and you want to find out whose ratings are closer to B's, you would say C's ratings are closer to B. If you look at A and say whose ratings are closer to A, you'll say, well, B's ratings are actually closer to A than uh, C's ratings are because B is closer, right? So it's possible to use distance as a measure of similarity of ratings, okay? So that's the idea here that we want to use the distance. And of course, once you find the similarity of ratings as a number, 
we can then find ways to calculate the weight because those who are closer we want to assign a higher weight those who are further away we want to assign a lower weight so that's how we are going to make problem i want to emphasize of course that euclidean distance as we have calculated here need not be the only way to calculate similarities there are many other measures distance measures available in statistics and mathematics but we are not going to go into those details here because all i'm trying to do here is to give you a flavor of some data mining techniques and that's why we are not looking at those things so here i'm taking an example of how to calculate the actual distance between two points so i've shrunk the table into just two columns so there's one column which shows your ratings another column showing somebody else's ratings and we're trying to calculate the distance between those two points okay earlier we had calculated the distance between two points which were in two dimensional space now we are calculating the distance between two points which are actually in one two three four five dimensional space because we are only going to consider the uh, those songs for which you have provided a rating because we are trying to find the distance between you and somebody else right so songs which you have not rated don't play a role in calculating the distance okay so in order to calculate the distance it's very easy all you have to do really is for every song find out the squared deviation so in this case in the first case the squared deviation is going to be 4 minus 3 1 1 squared is 1 in the case of yesterday the, the actual difference is 3 so the squared deviation is going to be 9 in the case of wizard of Oz, the actual deviation is 0 so the squared deviation is 0 and so on okay so that's the squared deviation and the distance is nothing but the square root of the total so the total deviation here is 11 and the distance therefore is going to be square root of 11 3.32 so that's one example of how you would calculate the distance between two people in terms of their ratings of songs okay now of course if two people have rated only two songs and whereas in other words if two people have only two songs in common and if two people have many more songs in common then there could be some subtleties in calculating the distance but we're not really worried about that we're just going to calculate the distance given how many of our points there are it's clearly a simplification but it'll suffice for this illustration another example uh, the deviation between you and mest in this case there are only three songs in common as opposed to the five songs which were there earlier and once again you can see we've applied the same approach 4 minus 3 1 1 squared is 1 3 minus 2 1 1 squared is 1 5 minus 5 0 and therefore 0 so the total deviation is 2 and the distance is therefore just the square root of 2 which is 1.414 so based on this it is clear that your ratings are much closer to that of mest than the ratings of want okay and therefore when it comes time to assign weights it'll make sense to assign a higher weight to mess ratings than to want ratings when it comes to trying calculating your weighted uh, rating for a particular song okay so the distance that we've got into a similarity rating this is very important to consider because after all can we just directly use the distance as a weight the distance clearly measures similarity lower the distance higher the similarity higher the distance lower the similarity but of course we are interested not in the distance per se we are interested in assigning a weight to a person's rating right that is we are saying my distance from this person is so much from this other person is so much well what weight should i give to the ratings of each of those people right can we use the distance directly as the weight actually that would be really wrong because higher distance means that our ratings are highly dissimilar which means the weight should be lower and lower distance means our ratings are highly similar so the weight should be higher okay in fact if the distance is zero then the weight should be very high because our ratings are extremely similar right so we have to be careful about how about interpreting distance now we may say well if the distance high distance means low rating and low distance means high rating should we not can we not just use uh, one divided by the distance as the rating we just invert it well that that's a step in the right direction because it at least gets the right magnitudes but the problem with using 
1 divided by the distance is that if two people have exactly identical ratings, then the distance is 0. And therefore, 1 divided by the distance would be 1 divided by 0, which is meaningless. As you know, dividing by 0 is not meaningful. And computers are especially allergic to dividing by 0. Programs which divide by 0 most often would just crash and burn right away. Right? So we need a different method, but we are in the right direction. We could use 1 divided by 1 plus distance which will never have the problem of dividing by zero. Okay, so that's the measure that we recommend. So we are going to say similarity or weight equals one divided by one plus distance. In this case, the denominator can never become zero. Even if the distance is zero, the denominator is going to be one. And therefore, if the distance is zero, then the similarity will be one divided by one, which is one. And if the distance is extremely large, meaning two people have highly dissimilar ratings, then the similarity or weight will be one divided by one plus a very large number. And that's going to be a very small number, right? So here, high distances will translate to small numbers and low distances will, tran will translate to high numbers, which is very nice. And of course, looking at this formula, you can see that the weight will always be between zero and one, which is also a nice thing. Okay, so most similar means one, which is identical ratings and least similar, which means distance is really high. One divided by one plus that very high value will come close to zero, right? So the weights that you get will be between zero and one. So now we have found out how given the ratings of two people, we can find out a weight to be assigned to, uh, to the ratings. Okay, so in this example, let's say the weights now we convert two values between 0 and 1, as I had mentioned earlier. So then we get the ratings would be slightly different. So we now assign weights of, uh, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.2 and 0 0.3, whereas earlier we had said 5, 3 and 2. But the net result is still exactly the same. So now let's make things completely concrete. So the problem once again is we've got this whole matrix of ratings. We want to find out what is going to be your rating for Fiddler on the roof. Okay, so how would we go about doing that? Well, in order to go about doing that, we first consider only people who have rated Fiddler on the roof, right? Which is going to be Ladik, Rosenthal, Poroff, McRae, and Wand. Those are the only people who have rated Fiddler on the roof. So for this exercise, we're not interested in the others. Now, what we want to find out is of course, we know their ratings, 4, 3, 4, 3, and 4 for this particular song. So what we want to find out is what weight should be assigned to each of those ratings. And the weighted average of those will be your rating for the song. We already know now how to calculate the weight, right? So we can take you and Ladik, find out the distance between you and Ladik using the formula that, using the approach that we had shown a couple of slides back, right? So you've got... Uh, common songs, which is La Bamba, Yesterday, uh, Mozart Symphony, and that's it. Those are the only things you have in common. So you'll take the square deviations for each of those songs and calculate the square root of the total. So that will give you the distance. And 1 divided by 1 plus the distance will give you the weight. So that's the weight for Ladik. Similarly, you'll calculate the weight for Rosenthal, the weight for Borov, weight for McRae, Henry, uh, McRae, and Wand. And you'll take a weighted average of each of their ratings multiplied by the weights and divide by the total of the weights. That will be the prediction for you. Okay, I'm not going to show you the actual calculations. What I'll suggest is uh, I'll give you a spreadsheet with all of these values. I suggest that you perform those calculations on Excel just to make sure that you understand everything. If I gave you the answers, then there would be nothing left for you to do and therefore less opportunity for you to internalize what we've spoken about. So I leave that as an exercise for you to do.